Our scripture reading this morning will be found in the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. Ephesians, chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. And the Pew Bible that can be found on page 1039. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with the might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height, to know that the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church of, by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. If you're again visiting with us this morning, we want to thank you so much for taking the time to to come and and, and study God's word with us, and uh, <clears throat> we hope and pray that that it will not be the last time that you're here with us. But every every opportunity that you have to to accompany us, we'll be more than happy to to have you with us here. And I'll be uh, <clears throat> I'll be asking you. Actually, my, I asked. Of your prayers, uh, I'll be traveling to Maxwell, uh, Texas, uh, for a week uh, to record a Greek course in Spanish. Uh, uh, be uh, teaching a few lessons, about 15 lessons, on how to study the New Testament using the Greek uh, knowledge. And so, please give me your prayers as I travel, and uh, and do that uh, for the benefit of the church. Uh, you know, I once did a bilingual. Uh, seminary on Greek, uh, going back and forth in English and Spanish. And I had, we had about, you know, 15 uh, members of the church there, you know, Spanish and English speaking. And uh, after about, after one hour, I, I noticed that as I was explaining in English, uh, the Greek material that I was presenting, the Spanish brethren kept going like this. You know, they kept agreeing with what I was saying. And so I, so I did a pause and I said, okay, okay, let's, let's hold on here. Uh, how many of you speak English uh, in the audience? And everybody, all the Spanish brethren, they were bilingual, so they raised their hands. And so I'm like, why am I doing this bilingual? You know, I can cover more material if I just do it in English than do it, you know, going back and forth, English and Spanish. And, say, and then the, the Spanish brethren said, I don't know why you're doing it bilingual. And I'm like, well, I didn't know that you guys you know, spoke English. But anyhow, so uh, sometimes that, that happens uh, when you do bilingual things, you know. Uh, but anyhow, please keep in your prayers as I do that. It'll, hopefully it'll be a great blessing to the church and, uh, and uh, so that we can study, uh, we, enjoy, we can enjoy uh, even more the study of God's word. Well, uh, humble prayer for power. That's found in Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, verses 14 through 21. This is our lesson number six, uh, believe it or not, <clears throat> from the book of Ephesians that I've been trying to do, probably taking two years maybe <laughs> to accomplish that. Uh, don't worry, we'll get to chapter six uh, uh, someday, somehow, before the Lord returns. But uh, this is our uh, last lesson from chapter three. We Remember we covered, uh, we talked about the, the mystery of Christ Last time I was here, uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through uh, verse uh, 13. And now we'll consider verses uh, 14 through uh, 21. And uh, by this lesson, we are basically through with the first three chapters of Ephesians. Uh, the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians uh, constitutes the doctrinal section of the book. Uh, and then chapters 4 through 6, <clears throat> that's basically the practical uh, aspect of the letter, the practical section. And so we'll be doing a lot of practical lessons uh, based on everything that we have learned in chapter one, 
uh, chapter 2 and chapter 3, based on all these great things that, that God has done for us. Now, uh, it is our responsibility to live a faithful life in Jesus Christ. But we will consider chapters 4, 5, and 6 uh, next, uh, next time, in the next uh, weeks to go. And so, uh, thus far, we have examined the great blessings with which God has blessed us. Chapters 1, 1 through 14, uh, Paul's prayer that the church may, be, uh, may know some great things. Uh, chapters 1, 15 through 23, and then uh, our old life outside of Christ and how we used to be dead in sin, but now made alive in Christ. That was the lesson from chapter 2, 1 through 10. And then Christ's perfect sacrifice and the blessings of reconciliation. That was a lesson in chapter 2, 11 through 22. And then as I just stated a few moments ago, uh, Christ's mystery revealed in God's eternal purpose. Uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through uh, 13. And so today we will examine basically uh, Paul's prayer uh, for on behalf of the church. Again, uh, <clears throat> I know I went fast uh, talking about the lessons that we already covered just want to remind you once again, you want a copy of all these lessons that I have presented, just, just uh, go on, uh, internet, on the internet to uh, Bible Knowledge, back to BibleKnowledge.com, uh, www.backtobiblenowledge.com, and you will be able to find all the lessons that, are, uh, that have been uh, preached there. And if you want to hear those lessons, so maybe, maybe not see me, but hear those lessons, you can go to the YouTube channel here at Beltline. Uh, you can see all the lessons, not only my lessons, but also the lessons from all the guest speakers that have been uh, around here. And so let's consider, let's examine the context of Paul's uh, prayer. Uh, we're going to see the remote context of Paul's prayer. Number two, the attitude and object of Paul's prayer. Number three, the purpose of Paul's prayer. And then the blessings of Paul's prayer. And so the context of Paul's uh, prayer. Uh, if you notice carefully, this is Paul's second prayer. The first prayer is found in chapter 1, verses 15 through 22. And that was a prayer uh, for God to bless the church at Ephesus with spiritual wisdom and understanding. And so <clears throat> the Apostle Paul prayed to God that the church may be blessed with that understanding and spiritual wisdom. Now the second prayer, which is found in chapter 3, verses 14 through 21, uh, this is Paul's second prayer where he actually prays that the church may be strengthened, that the church may have the spiritual power to do God's will. And notice the phrase there in chapter uh, 3, uh, where it says, for this reason, uh, for this uh, reason, uh, basically uh, this uh, phrase appears three times in this letter, in chapter 3, verse 1, uh, 3, 14, and also chapter 5 and verse uh, 31. Uh, found again in all these uh, verses, <clears throat> for this reason, basically Paul is linking what he just previously said in the remote context, what he just said about chapter 1, <clears throat> chapter 2, and early part of chapter 3. This is what Paul has in mind when he says, for this reason, he basically bows his uh, knees. And so Paul is greatly encouraged uh, by all the great things that God has done for uh, the church and we should be uh, thankful to God for the great things that he has done uh, for us. You know, prayer must be emphasized and practiced by each child of God. You know, 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. Uh, Ephesians chapter uh, 6 and verse 18, pray for one another. Colossians 4.2, to, to persevere in prayer. And so Paul is an example, an example of the kind of prayer that we need to be doing. And so that, that's basically the remote context of, once again, of Paul's prayer. Now let's consider the attitude, <clears throat> the attitude and object of Paul's prayer. Notice the phrase, I bow my knees. I bow my knees. What kind of attitude does this phrase suggest? I bow my knees. Well, <clears throat> if you look at it carefully, it suggests an attitude of submission to God, an attitude of reverence to God, an attitude of respect uh, towards God, 
a recognition of God's glory and sovereignty as seen in Revelation chapter 4. Remember Revelation chapter 4, the four living creatures, the 24 elders, how they bow before the throne of God and how they show respect and reverence to God. And that's the kind of attitude that we need to have as we approach our heavenly Father, uh, kind of attitude that once again shows submission, respect, reverence towards our Heavenly Father. <clears throat> you know, some people uh, pray to God, but without the proper attitude. Uh, for example, as, as we know, we had about two, three prayers at the beginning. Where was your mind as you were praying, uh, as our brother was leading us in the word prayer? Was your mind somewhere uh, somewhere else? Was your mind thinking about where I'm going to eat lunch uh, after services? Uh, was your mind <clears throat> somewhere else? I hope not. I hope that you were uh, connected with that prayer so that at the end you can say amen along with the brother that led that prayer. Again, you know, there are times when prayers do not have the proper attitude. You are Reminded of the Pharisee and the tax collector, remember, actually the publican in, in Luke chapter 18, uh, how both prayed to God, but God heard only one prayer. And that was the publican who had a humble, a humble attitude towards God. And so, <clears throat> you know, that was not the case with the Apostle Paul. He always prayed with the right attitude. He prayed kneeling down. If you remember, uh, in Bible class, we made reference to Acts chapter 20. Uh, in Acts 20, when uh, Paul met with the elders at Ephesus, when he you know, discussed with them certain topics, at the end, at the beach, they knelt down and went to God in prayer. And so we also see Stephen uh, pray kneeling down as he was uh, dying, Acts chapter 7 and verse uh, 16. You know, we have, <clears throat> we have no specific... Uh, posture on prayer uh, that, is, that has been demanded by God, but the attitude, the right attitude is what counts as we pray to God. Somebody may uh, kneel down in prayer, but his attitude may not be the kind of attitude that God demands. And so let's pay attention to the attitude as we cultivate a life of prayer. Notice how Paul describes God as the Father from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Verse uh, 15. And some have suggested that, that the Jews believe that angels were God's family in heaven and that men and women were his family on earth. Uh, God is now the Father of Jews and Gentiles. Remember that Jews and Gentiles in chapter 2, they are now members of the same body. Remember that they have been reconciled uh, to God. And so and also in chapter 3, it was emphasized in, in Christ's mystery that the Gentiles also now enjoy the blessing of eternal life. They have the same blessings uh, of salvation as the Jews have them. <clears throat> and so Jews and Gentiles are not part of God's uh, family. And so we also have to remember <clears throat> that all blessings are found in Jesus Christ in the heavenly places. So uh, we are somewhat connected to heaven because of Jesus Christ. And we are sitting together with Christ in the heavenly places. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6 as well. And so we enjoy a perfect connection and fellowship with our heavenly Father. And Paul is reminding us of this. God is our Father. And because we have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ and we are now members of the body of Jesus Christ, the spiritual family of God, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19. We are no longer strangers or sojourners, but are members of the family of God, members of the household of God. And so God <clears throat> is our Father. But let's consider now the purpose, the purpose of Paul's uh, prayer. Uh, notice there in chapters uh, 3, verses 16 through verse 19. <clears throat> so let's read that phrase again together. 
chapter 3, verses 16 through 19. It says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with my through his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that, uh, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. <clears throat> now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. And so notice the purpose of Paul's prayer here. Uh, says to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. And this is a request, again, this is a request for our inner man, inner man to our spiritual inner man to be strengthened and not with our physical uh, man. So Paul is not praying that the church at Ephesus be strengthened physically so that we can able to, you know, uh, pick up, you know, 300 uh, pounds of weight uh, and be strong physically speaking. No, Paul is talking in a spiritual context. <clears throat> he wants the church at Ephesus uh, for them to receive that spiritual power that will enable them to do God's will, that will enable them to know, to fully know the love of uh, Christ in them. Notice it says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. When Christians trust and obey God, then this is a sign that Christ dwells in them. And, um, and so this means that we enjoy a special fellowship, once again, with Christ and God. Notice that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, you're probably thinking about, well, Brother Willie, didn't, didn't Christ start dwelling in us uh, when we obeyed the gospel? Uh, weren't the member, were the church at Ephesus already members of the Church of Christ, Christians? Yes, they were already Christians. But you know, Paul is not, not saying here that Christ was not dwelling in them in the past from the moment they obeyed the gospel to the present. The idea of Paul here is basically saying, <clears throat> I want God to bless you with strength so that you may know, so that Christ may, may take up his residence, may take up his home permanently with you. You know, and the word, the verb here, dwell, is found in the aorist tense, which means an action that is once and for all. For example, the aorist tense appears in Acts 2.38 uh, with reference to baptism. How many times are we baptized for the forgiveness of our sins? Uh, five times? <clears throat> Twenty times? No, one time. We are baptized once and for all, just one time. And so here, Paul's idea is using the heiress, uh, basically saying you know, that Christ once and for all may take up his residence, may settle permanently uh, with you in your life, in your inner man. And that's basically the idea here. Is Christ dwelling in our hearts today? Is Christ dwelling in our inner man, spiritual inner man today? Well, you have to realize <clears throat> that, that if we do not live a faithful life in Jesus Christ, that's not going to happen. Uh, that's not going to ha happen because God, Christ, the Holy Spirit will not have fellowship with a Christian who has departed from the faith and is no longer living a faithful life in Jesus Christ. But that's not the case with the church at Ephesus. Paul is asking God once again that they may, that Christ may dwell in their hearts. And notice, through faith. That's the key right there. That's the key phrase, through faith. And we just uh, define faith during Bible class. It is a complete trust complete obedience, complete submission to God. If those things are not present in our lives, Christ will not dwell in <clears throat> us, in our hearts. And also Paul says, you know, to be rooted and grounded in love. 
And so the idea of a planted tree, well-rooted, and, and a firm building uh, is the idea here. When you have a tree that has been rooted, grounded, uh, that tree, you know, you can have a hurricane come by. And I have seen uh, trees. I grew up in a place where there were a lot of trees. And there was a hurricane that actually came by. And those trees continue to remain even today. They were really rooted uh, and grounded. And so that's the kind of life that God wants us to have. That's the kind of life that is rooted and grounded in Christ's love. It also says to be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, and the height of Christ's love. How much do we know Christ's love, brothers and sisters? How much do we truly, truly know the love of Christ? And, you know, as we consider all the things that Christ has done for us, how he died on the cruel cross of Calvary, <clears throat> he died for our sins, he showed so much love for us, he showed the love, the grace, the mercy, and the kindness of God through his sacrifice. How much do we really know and appreciate the love of Christ? Do we really know that? Because if we do, <clears throat> if we acknowledge the love of Christ and all the things that Christ and God has done for us, if we truly acknowledge those things, that will encourage us to live a faithful life in Christ. That will encourage us uh, to excel in the things that we do for the Lord. And we're not going to be passive but active in the work of the Lord if we truly know, once again, what Christ has done for us. You know, if we truly remember every single day of our lives the kind of love that rescues us from sin, the kind of love that Christ showed us, the kind of love that God uh, showed us. If we had that kind of love in our minds every single day, trust me, that would keep us away from doing things that are contrary to God's will. And so may we <clears throat> be able to comprehend, notice, with all the saints. He wants all the saints to know, once again, this kind of love. It also says to be filled with all the fullness of God. He wants us, the, the complete <clears throat> fullness of God, to be in us, to be able to enjoy that fellowship with our Heavenly Father, to know God even more. How much do you know God? How much do you know Christ? You know, it takes a dedicated life, a dedicated life described in Philippians 1.21, to be able to enjoy uh, these great things that Paul is praying for. Philippians 1.21, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Everything, everything uh, in the life of the Apostle Paul was done to please Christ. Every single decision that Paul took, <clears throat> that Paul made in his life, uh, Christ was always there was always present. You know, uh, try to encourage my family every time we say, we're going to go here, we're going to go there, Lord willing. <clears throat> always say, Lord willing. Okay, uh, tomorrow we'll pay you a visit, Lord willing. <clears throat> you know, if it's God's will, then we will do this. Uh, we need to start cultivating that dedicated life to the honor and glory of our Heavenly Father. And notice that this spiritual power will enable us to finish the race. Remember, we are in a race uh, towards heaven. <clears throat> and we find all kinds of obstacles in this race. And Satan doesn't want us to make it to heaven. He is that roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour, 1 Peter 5.8. He is the tempter, 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 5. And so we need that spiritual power to give us the strength that is necessary to be able to finish that race. Again, I'll ask you, how many years have you been a Christian? 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. If you've been a Christian for, let's say, 
50 or 60 years. Uh, how do you explain being able to sit here this morning and, and, and still be faithful to God? Who has given you the strength, the encouragement, and everything that you need to be able to please God and do His will? Is it all by yourself? Uh, no, it's not uh, all by ourselves. Second Corinthians chapter 3, uh, verse 4 <clears throat> says this, verse 4 and 5. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 4 and 5 says, And we have such trust or such confidence through Christ toward God. Not, notice, not, emphasis there, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency, our sufficiency is from God. You know, Jesus said in, in the context of, I am the true vine for uh, John chapter 15, verse 5, Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And then Philippians 4.13, remember that first passage? You learned that when, in Sunday school when you were a child. I can do all things through Jesus Christ who gives me the strength. And again, Philippians 1.6, He, I have been confident of this very thing, that He who has begun the good work in you will perfect it, will complete it, to the, uh, to the day of Christ. And so we have everything that we need, brothers and sisters. And that power, that spiritual power that also comes through the powerful word of God. Romans 1.16, the apostle Peter said in 2 Peter 1.3, that all things that pertain to life and godliness have been granted unto us. So we have everything. We have everything. And so... We, Paul is actually praying that this power may help us to endure uh, affliction as well, to live faithfully in Jesus Christ, and to be able to practice all the imperatives that we find in this letter to the Ephesians. And notice that wonderful phrase in verse 16, according to the riches of his grace. Everything according to the riches of his glory. Everything that Paul has mentioned in the, in the remote context of this verse 16, uh, all this power can come to us according to the riches of his glory. Remember Philippians 4.19, And my God shall supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And so we are thankful that God, that Paul prayed to God with a humble attitude, uh, pray to God for God to continue to strengthen the church at Ephesus. And that prayer continues to be on our behalf because Paul not only wanted the church at Ephesus to be strengthened, but the church, uh, the universal church, all the members of the body of Jesus Christ. We are tremendously blessed, brothers and sisters. Uh, by enjoying, experiencing the power of God in our lives. Again, it's not a physical power, a physical strength, but it's a spiritual power who will enable us to continue once again serving our Heavenly uh, Father. And so we've got to keep that uh, in mind. Let me uh, finish by reading 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 and follow. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 4, <clears throat> verses 7 and follow. But we have this treasure in earthland vessels, that the excellence of the power, notice, may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. 
always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our bodies. And so notice what Paul is actually uh, saying here. And that's the kind of power that works in us, brothers and sisters. I mean, we always thank God for that kind of spiritual power that has enabled us to get to the point where we are right now and will continue to enable us to finish the race so that one day we can say like the Apostle Paul, for the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to those who love his appearing. Second Timothy 4, 7 and 8. Again, thank God for that wonderful prayer, that humble prayer on our behalf, so that we may be strengthened in our spiritual inner man. If you are here this morning and you still have not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, Remember, you are lost in sin. There is no hope for you outside of Christ. You need Jesus Christ to be able to make it and be saved. There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which men must be saved. Acts 4 and verse 12. Jesus said, I am the only way to salvation. John 14, 6. He said, I am the door. He that comes through me shall be saved. John 10, 9. So the, the question is, how can you go through Jesus Christ? How can you be in that way that will take you to heaven? Well, you have to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the power of God to salvation. Romans 1, 16. That message that tells you that Jesus Christ came. He died for your sins. Was buried. But then on the third day, he was raised from the dead and then you have to believe in that message you be willing to repent of your sins confess jesus christ as the son of god before this audience so that christ can confess you before his heavenly father one day and be baptized be immersed in water for the purpose of receiving the forgiveness of your sins acts 22 16 and acts 2 38 and after that All you have to do is enjoy Christianity, serving God faithfully, uh, working and growing uh, in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. And so if you need to uh, respond to the invitation, please do so as together we stand and sing.